Thank you so much. It's great to be with you again. Pray that I can be a blessing in the Word. I'm going to be speaking to you from Ephesians and chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'll read it uh, uh, to you. I think you're there behind those lights. <laughs> yeah, okay, a few people there. Good, praise the Lord. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, then we'll look into that. Probably uh, Ephesians speaks more about the church than any other New Testament epistle. And I think that the church is a, a wonderful, wonderful purpose of God, that he should have a people. He's always wanted a people. And I think when I got converted, it was uh, an exciting thing to find, having had no Christian background at all, and then becoming a Christian, I could know God personally. I mean, that was like an amazing discovery. You could, you could have a personal relationship with God, uh, and I could do my personal devotions, my personal evangelism, and and when I first got saved, it was, everything was really just an individualistic thing. That was, I, I found Jesus. And, and really, that tended to be the style of uh, how things were. You know, uh, uh, Billy Graham came to England, and many people became Christians. And, and, the, and the word was, well, go and find a church of your choice. And, uh, you know, that's kind of secondary, really. Uh, you, you know, you might find somewhere to go. Uh, really, it's you and Jesus that's the big deal. And as time went on for me as a Christian, I, I began to discover that's not actually the emphasis of the Bible. In fact, the very first people who were converted, if you like, on the day of Pentecost, it says 3,000 were added. It doesn't say they were converted. It says they were added. In other words, they became part of the community. They became part of God's people together. Uh, and the more you read the New Testament, the more you become aware God always wanted a people. In the Old Testament, he had a people. And now he has a new people, a people made up of many tribes and tongues and languages. And it's a unique, it's like a nation. It's like a, a glorious, special people. And uh, the more you go on as a Christian, the more you come to prize and value what it is to be in this people, among these people. And that's one of the reasons why we had to kind of try and start church again a bit. Because for some of us, for me, my background, uh, coming out of an unbelieving world and then going to church, uh, I, I'd, I'd grown up with a, a lot of close friends through my teenage years. I mean, we talk about anything and everything into the middle of the night. You, you just you didn't keep anything back. It was great just talking and, and knowing people in a real close-up way. And then I got saved... And actually, I lost all my friends. I got them to church once, all of them, but once. And then they said, oh, and then they never came again. And, uh, and then I, when I got in there, because it was really weird, it, it said on the wall, do not speak to one another in the sanctuary. <laughs> and that was pretty common in, in those days. You don't speak because it's like a library. You're in the museum now. You're in the library. Don't speak in the library. Don't speak in the church. Because it's kind of a holy place, which, no, no, we're a holy people, and the place is pretty irrelevant. Uh, and, and, yeah, we need to speak. We need to speak. We need to get to know. You see, you cannot become a mature Christian alone. It's impossible. It's impossible. Uh, the Bible makes that clear. We need one another to become mature. We need one another to grow in our, in our, our faith, uh, and we learn from one another and with one another. That's the way it is. And that's what comes out very clearly uh, in this passage I'm going to read with you in a moment. Uh, uh, and in the book of Ephesians, this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he talks about the church from many uh, perspectives. He, he says the church is like a new man, a completely new man. He says the church is like a temple of stones being built together, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. He says the church is the bride of Christ. In chapter 6, he says the church is like an army with soldiers. So he looks at it from several different angles. It's like holding up a diamond and seeing different uh, aspects, light shining in and through. And in this chapter, particularly Ephesians chapter 4, he speaks of the church as a body, like a many-membered body. That, that intimate, like my hands are part of my body. My feet just got me up on the platform. My hands are waving around. My eyes are looking at you. Uh, and they're integrated, absolutely integrated. And for us to be what God wants us to be, he wants us to be absolutely integrated so that he can have a people who celebrate his presence. That's always how it has been in God's 
uh, purpose from the beginning. Initially, in the Old Testament, all people had Abraham's blood, just one particular family. Then in the New Testament, more blood from many, many nations, many, many tribes and backgrounds, but into one people. And so being integrated is massive. It's hugely important. So the, the, kind of bio, the kind of church that says, do not speak in the sanctuary is missing the point. It's missing the point. And my old pastor, lovely, lovely Baptist pastor, I loved him very much, terrific preacher, and he used to say, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. That was one of his favorite verses. It meant be here next week. <laughs> don't forsake the gap. But he didn't complete the verse, because it goes on to say, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves, but encourage one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near, encourage one another. Well, we weren't allowed to. You're not allowed to speak in the church. <laughs> and for myself, coming from a completely non-Christian world, trying to learn how to be a Christian was very hard because, well, you just say, thank you, pastor, for your lovely word and go home. I needed, I needed people to talk to. And, the, and it says encourage one another. Did you know there are over 40 one another verses in the New Testament? Over 40. And we weren't doing any of them. Not one of them. How can we grow up into be a body if we weren't doing any of them? God wants us to help one another. People have come to the front this morning, shared things they feel God is speaking to them about to encourage one another. And we don't just do it through the mic. We do it over coffee. We do it all sorts of settings. We do it in our small groups. We help one another. We heard this terrific testimony here this morning at the beginning of our meeting. And someone was encouraging her last night. Now go on, go on, press through. She was encouraged by another. It wasn't just listen to the preacher, go on your way. No, someone said, go on, press through. Right. We encourage one another through. And so dear friends, if, if you've only just started coming, or maybe you're someone who says, well, I go to this church this week, I might try another one next week. I know I go around, I try to belong to the whole thing. No, that, that's missing the point. You need to be knitted in. You need to be part of the family, part of the body. You can't get much more intimate than one body. And so we're going to look at that kind of teaching that comes through in Ephesians chapter 4. I'll read the verse 16 verses, okay? Therefore, and Paul's saying, um, sorry, stopping myself again, the first three chapters are really telling us what God has done for us in Christ. What God has done. God has done this amazing thing in saving us and making us his own putting us into Jesus and all that. We haven't time to go through, but this is a response. So it starts with therefore. And there are lots of places in the epistles in the Bible which initially says, this is all that God's done. Now, therefore, this is how you respond. And this is one of those. So, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as we're all called into the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of of Christ's gift. We just go to verse 10. He who descended is himself he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for equipping of the saints, for the works of service, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What a verse that is. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. If 
Father, we uh, celebrate the wonder of Jesus. You have no rival. You have no equal. No one compares, Lord Jesus, to your stunning reality. No one else could stand and say, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Thank you for bringing us out of darkness to know you who are the light of the world. You are the bread of life. You are all that we need. We're so thrilled to have found you, Lord. Thank you for not leaving us out in the dark, Lord, ignorant of you. Thank you for mercy, kindness. Thank you for the person who spoke to us, opened our eyes, brought us into your family. And Father, please, in Jesus' name, let your spirit come. Please lead us into truth now. Please do us good, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, there's obviously uh, several ways we could approach this uh, wonderful chapter. I want to approach it from a particular line of emphasizing the place of love. We're going to find in this passage there are three places where love is emphasized. It's interesting that where uh, the body is taught and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are taught in the New Testament, there's always an emphasis on love. So you find 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is all about gifts of the Spirit, chapter 14 about body and gifts, and then 13, this whole beautiful hymn of love, 1 Corinthians 13. Like, this works, this body thing, these gifts of the Spirit, they work where love is central, where love is central. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Hey, here we're going to find a love emphasis. You'll find similar in uh, Romans 12, there's a list there, and you'll find love has an important part, even in 1 Peter 4, where there's a brief reference, you'll find again love. Love is absolutely essential for a body to function. We all love our own flesh. A human body functions because, well, it, it works for itself. It's, you don't get anything working against any part of your body. All parts of the body serve one another. And that's what God wants. He wants a, a glorious church that stands in stark contrast to a world that sadly is very often hostile, complaining, offensive, angry, uh, online, in, a, in, in all sorts of places people fight back. They're, they're kind of lonely and angry and hostile. And we who have been reconciled to God have a context where we can work out that together so that but the church becomes a city set on a hill that can't be hid. It becomes a community. We recently, I was speaking a couple of weeks ago to an academy in the UK, and a guy, I was just meeting people before we started, he said, oh, I, I became a Christian a few years ago. He said, I used to live opposite the church which uh, I used to be in in Brighton, a place called Clarendon Villas. He said, I used to live opposite the church building. And he said, I noticed every Sunday, as the people were spilling out, he wasn't a Christian at all, not, no, not, never been to church, he saw them, I saw them spilling out. He said, I just saw how they were together. He said they were always warm and friendly uh, and affectionate. He said, I used to watch this and watch this, and, and I think, wow, look at that. And, and then at some point, something triggered him off to find, could he find God? He thought, I'm going to go to that church. And now he, he's become a Christian. He's on the academy training for leadership. And I think, yeah, what was it? It was the people of God being the people of God that shone into his home. We didn't even know. He's looking through the curtains <laughs> in the room opposite, watching these people. And we don't even know. But a, a people, you see, there's, a, there's the sort of corporateness that shines. It's not just the individual. It's, the, it's being a people together. So how does this work? Well, we find here there are three times where the phrase in love emphasis so here it is at the beginning of the chapter it says showing tolerance for one another or forbearance depends which translation you're using we tend to use lots of different translations these days showing forbearance or tolerance for one another in love okay bearing with one another could be a literal translation that's the first one that's the kind of gateway in it's a, it's a chapter as I said, when we got to chapter, verse 13, it's an amazing chapter. It talks about a, a people, a, a body that comes to a mature man, to the measure of the stature 
of Christ. You think, wow, that is a real body for a, a body. I was looking at my Bible this morning where John writes in his epistle, the life was manifested. We touched and handled. We lived with God for three years. The life was manifested. That's how he starts his epistle. It's an amazing way to start an epistle. The life was manifested. We handled and touched the life. We saw the life. We saw the body of Christ. We saw this man, Jesus of Nazareth. We were with him. We touched him, handled and listened to him. Wow. The life was manifested. Now, Paul says about the church, the church should come to the fullness of the stature of Christ to a mature man. So the people who look at the church and say, wow, the life was manifested. But the life for us is something we do together. Together. It's not just one isolated saint. And do you know, all these things in the Bible are done together. So the Bible doesn't say be kind. Be nice to be kind, kind of philosophical concept. It says be kind to one another. Forgiving one another. You know, you can't be kind in a room with the door shut. It's how we, how we cope with one another. And what tends to happen is, you know, some of us were very nice before we became Christian. You know, you may be raised in a Christian home, you're taught lots of Christian principles, even before you stepped into the light. But some of us didn't. Some of us came from a long way out. And so God's got to do a lot on us. Actually, God's got to do a lot on all of us. But some of it's more obvious than others. <laughs> and so God's changing us. And, and often, this is the reality, often there'll be reason to offend one another. And this verse starts, this sort of gateway into this wonderful chapter, that's gonna, the chapter's going to build to the fullness of the stature of Christ. It starts with a kind of very lowly way in, where it says, bear with one another. Bear with one another. Why? Because we offend one another. You know, why wasn't my name on the list? Why didn't someone tell, there's a meeting, no one told me there was a meeting. Someone forgot you. Why wasn't I asked to be in the music group? Let me know how good I am. And, and so what can happen is we are people who are being changed and we can get offended. We can get upset. And to be honest, if we hadn't worked at this kind of church, and so now this is important to us. We need a new wineskin for this new sense of the presence of God amongst us. That's why we started new churches. I thought, now I cannot have a church where I can't speak to one another. However great the preaching is, we need to get into one another's lives. We need to find somewhere. And, and so what will happen is, yeah, we're not perfect, so we mess up. We tread on one another's foot. We say things we didn't mean to say. And so Paul comes in very carefully and says, look, bear in love, bearing with one another. Do you find that easy? They think, ah, the music was too loud again. <laughs> well, they didn't sing the song I like. See, it's very easy to murmur and complain. And in Philippians 2, Paul talks about, he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God's at work in you. And then he says, stop murmuring, complaining. Because that, that's the world we live in. I don't know about Canada, really. I'm a bit of a stranger here. Um, England is famous for complaining. <laughs> it may be here as well. We complain about this, we complain about we can taxes and Brexit and oh, people moan about things all the time. And the Christ Christians should actually kind of stand out. And in this community, we should stand out. These people don't moan all the time. Why? Well, because we've, we've learned in love to bear with one another. Now, how do we do that? Well, it's in the passage. It says, with all humility and gentleness and patience. So there's three keys. Let's just think about that. Lowliness. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly of heart. It's one of the things Jesus said. It's amazing. This is God in the flesh. And he said, I am meek and lowly. I am humble and gentle. You could translate it. Now humility in the days when Paul lived was uh, uh, in the Greek culture that he is introducing, the church is getting born into a Greek culture, Greek and Roman combination, really. And humility was completely despised. It wasn't a thing that someone prized. And that's beginning to be the case in our modern Western world. 
Humility isn't prized so much anymore. It, it, it says this, what a guy called uh, uh, Armitage Robinson, he says this, to the Greek mind, humility was little else than a vice. It was weak, mean-spirited. It was the temper of a slave. It was inconsistent with that self-respect which every true man owed himself. That was the culture. Hey, you pride on yourself. Hey, how dare you? Because you've got to, you know, I, I am somebody here. Don't you know where I come from? Don't you know who I am? That's that. And so for slaves, because the whole, the, the, the nation was full of slaves all around the Greek culture, the Roman culture. They reckon the Roman church was half slaves. Half slaves. And now you've got people who, you know, you've got slaves sitting next to me in church. Do you mind? And that, that would be the natural culture. And Paul says, how could I bear with one another? Well, one way you do it is not having a very high view of yourself. How did they not tell me? Well, who do you think you are then? Well, I'm pretty important. <laughs> But if we don't have a high view of ourselves, the fact they didn't tell you, well, why would they tell me? Why would they tell me? So my name wasn't on the list. Well, who am I anyway? And so Paul is giving us keys and clues how to bear with people. Bearing with other people has a lot to do with what you think of yourself. If you think you're pretty important, <coughs> you're going to have difficulty with some people. Because you're, well, you're important. They should, tr they should treat you. No, if you don't really, if you're not very impressed with yourself, if you've seen the cross and seen the Son of God hanging there and you're still proud, man, you've got something to learn. We should be humbled by this. Have this mind in that was in Christ Jesus, who being equal with God, humbled himself. I'm lowly, I'm meek. This is the Son of God. He said, didn't count equality with God something to hang on to, to that's what it means. It's like, it's like, you know, imagine the plan of salvation's coming and, and, and God's plan, how, no, how, how do we know that happened in the Trinity? You know, we're going to save the human race. How are we going to do this? You know, look around among the angels, what are we going to do? Uh, and then maybe eyes fall on, Je hey, come on, hey, I am the son of God. I don't do that kind of thing. Hey, come on. Uh, equality with God, hey, hey. No, no, instead of that position, he thought, no, no, I'm uniquely qualified. I could be the mediator. I could take on human form. Wow. Yeah. The one that all the angels are celebrating and worshipping. The, the idol of heaven, the glory, the delight of the Father. You? Yeah, I'll do it. Wow. He humbled himself. <coughs> Took on human form. Be found in human form. He became a servant. Was obedient. To death on our cross. So, beloved... That, that, uh, that Jesus, that wonderful Jesus we've been singing, wonderful name you have, that's got to work right into my soul. So who do I think I am? I'm some lump of trash that God, Jesus, saved me and brought me in. See, if we come in with self-importance, it's quite difficult to bear with other people. If you come in thinking, well, phew, thank God he saved me. If you come in with a lowly heart, it's easier to bear with other people. That's what Paul is saying here, with lowliness and with gentleness or meekness. Meekness, that's a word you don't often hear in, in society today. It's not something to be kind of proud of. He's a meek person. Do you know, Winston Churchill said about the leader of the opposition, a guy called Clement Attlee, he said, he's a very humble man. He said, but there again, he has much to be humble about. <laughs> One of those scathing Churchill remarks. <laughs> yeah, not to be humble about. But here Paul is prizing this. He's saying, no, no. And it's the Greek word is, is, is the word praus. And do you know it's the word that you use when a horse is broken in? That horse, you know, you see these movies where there's a kind of great stallion horse and no one can ride it until the great hero comes in, you know, whether it's Clint Eastwood or whoever. Some guy just hangs in there. And, and eventually the horse becomes prouse. It becomes meek. Does that mean it's got no more power? It's not fast anymore? No, not at all. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means it doesn't kick back anymore. That's what God wants with us. We don't kick back. How dare you? What about me? Who do you think you are? 
No, prowess means you don't kick back anymore. It doesn't mean you're not fast. It doesn't mean you're not skillful. It says about Moses, he was the meekest man in all the earth. God loved him. He's the meekest man in all the earth. What a statement. But when he comes down from the mountain, you remember, he was meek in that some guy spoke against him, said, Moses, who do you think you are? The sons of Korah. They said, who do you think you are? Even Miriam and Aaron came against Moses at one time. Hey, you set yourself up. I mean, he never defended himself. He would never defend himself. But notice, when he comes down from the mountain and they've made a golden calf, he comes down, he breaks the Ten Commandments, he says, grind that thing down to dust, put it in the water, drink it. You think, now this is supposed to be the meekest man in all the earth. <laughs> well, he's meek when they're talking about him. When the glory of God's at stake, boy, that's a scary guy. But he's not like that about himself. When they said, who do you think you are? He said, hey, well, this is what I'm, I'm the leader of the nation. What do you think? God chose me. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't react. God, God deals with God opens the earth and swallows these guys. But God, God the, uh, Moses, see, beloved, if we're going to build a beautiful church and a wonderful people, we, we've got to learn this lowliness, meekness. We don't want to, but you know, I, I had a word, I was going to bring a word. Uh, and the guy holding the mic said, I don't think so. He said, don't think so, I got a word from God. He said, no, thank you. Well, I'm not leaving this, I'm leaving this church, I'll leave the church. Wouldn't accept my word. See, that, that happens in church life. See, why did you leave that? Oh, I left that place. We, we don't want that, beloved. We want to build a wonderful church where we care, where we acknowledge, we say, okay, we don't fight for ourselves. That's how you bear with other people. How do you bear with them? Well, when you're not very impressed with yourself. That's what it's saying, with lowliness, with meekness, and then it says, with patience. Those are the three words, with patience. 1 Corinthians 13 says plainly, love is patient. It's just true. It's just a true statement. Love is patient. We, Wendy and I, my wife and I, we've got 19 grandkids. How about that? 19 <laughs> grandkids. And so we have these little ones coming in and out of our home all the time. Beautiful. We love it. And, you know, you don't see, you know, the little one trying to walk. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Boom, fall over. Come on, come on. Try again. Boom, fall over. Come on, come on. You don't say, okay, wait till you're two and then walk. <laughs> you just say, come on, have another go. Because love is patient. It just is. It's not try and be. It is. And so Paul says, look, bearing with one another with lowliness and meekness and patience. That's the way we do it. God wants us to do that. So we can build a great church. I long for you to build a great church. Looks like, I went and looked at the warehouse the other day, it looks like God's got great plans for you. Whoa, Lord. I've seen this in so many places, beloved. I've been to lots of places that started with a little house church. I could take you to many, I mean, honestly, many. The one I've been in Brighton, we started with just about 30 people. Don Smith started with 14 people. I've seen it again and again. Now they're in huge warehouses. They're pumping, they're hitting the town, they're having impact. God's on the journey. But, beloved, more important than warehouse is that we build well, relationally. We, we care for one another. So we don't get quickly offended. You've been offended with anybody? Oh, I don't sit, I, she sits that side, I sit the other side. I, don't, I can't stand her. Can't stand her. Let's not go to the mic again. Oh. oh, no, no, please. We've got to be patient bearing with one another. That's what God's saying. This is the way into this church becoming a glorious church. And then it says, why, why do you do that? Well, I'm just working through the verse, expo expounding the passage, right? It says, why? Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. You're trying to preserve something. What is it? The unity of the Spirit. What's the unity of the Spirit? Well, it's the unity which the Holy Spirit gives. God has brought us into a, a body which is supernatural. It's not a local club. It's not a club we've joined. 
It's a supernatural phenomenon. And, and, and in the early church, you had Jews and Greeks who before were utterly separated, utterly separated. They discovered a, 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 an engraving thing where the temple had been years and years ago. It said, it still said, if any Gentile steps over this, they are responsible for the death that ensues. Like, whoa. I mean, there was just total division. Gentile dogs. That's how they regarded one another. And now, the, you find Peter. You remember Peter? Incredible. The, it must have been such an experience for these Jewish people who had been following God for years, suddenly to meet with Jesus and this new, new covenant and this coming of the Spirit. And, and, and Peter, in the early Acts, He's praying one day, and he sees, a, he sees a vision of a sheet coming down from heaven, and in it there's all kind of animals. And the word comes to him from God, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, oh, no, no, I'm a Jew, I don't, I don't eat that kind of stuff. And it happens three times. Arise, Peter, oh, no, I don't do this, I don't do this. And then God, <laughs> three times, come on, arise, Peter. And it must have been so strange for Jews, you're not allowed to do this, and suddenly now you can. Yeah, wow, are you allowed to do that? We're allowed to eat. It's like, can you, go to, can you eat pork and go to heaven? It's like you eat pork and go to heaven quicker. <laughs> it's like, but it must have been amazing, that the, new, the new liberty. You, and so God, and then he said, right, he's trying to work, what, what is this all about? Why is God telling me that what I call clean, don't you call unclean? Peter's got to hold on. That, what, what is he saying to me? Then there comes a knock at the door. Some, Jew, uh, some Roman soldiers coming and say, Cornelius had a dream. God said to him, send for Peter. Who's Cornelius? A Roman. I mean, Roman rats. They're rats that just dominate our nation, take taxes of us, tell us what to do. Hated Romans. Uh, and come with us. And the Spirit said, I'd, I'd better go to these dreadful Romans. Uh, and, uh, and see, if he steps inside a Gentile house, he's now unclean. Old Testament, you can't go to the temple. You've got to get all go through cleansing and all kinds of stuff. So, how can, uh, this Gentile home. He's feeling all strange. Uh, and he, he begins to preach. It says in, in Acts chapter 10, there's the actual history. Acts chapter 11 repeats it. Because he's, he's on the carpet. After the apostle said, What were you doing going to that home? So he tells it all over again. So you get it twice over. It's like the book of Acts is shouting at you God is doing something new. So he's in Cornelius' home and he's, and he's preaching. He's just about said enough about forgiveness of sins through Jesus and the Holy Spirit falls on, the Corn on Cornelius and all these soldiers, these Gentiles, and they're all speaking in tongues. It says so in Acts 10. A and Peter says, What's going on here? <laughs> These Romans have got the Holy Spirit. That's outrageous. How could that happen? And he said, wow, God's opening. It's a unity. The Spirit introduced it to them. The Holy Spirit was ahead of Peter. Peter's still working out what are the implications of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit's going ahead and making it manifest. No, they're in as well. And in the next chapter, Peter's explaining to the, uh, the, the other apostles in chapter 11, he says, I was just beginning to speak, he says. In chapter 10, he's speaking, and he said, I just began to speak. And the Spirit fell on them like he did on us at the beginning. And they said, who are we to withstand God? In other words, hey, I'm in unity with that Roman. That dreadful, horrible guy. The Holy Spirit's come upon him. And I've got, they've got the Holy Spirit like we have. Wow, it's a unity of the Spirit. Something bigger than us. Other than us. Being, it's descended upon us. The unity of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a nice feeling. And we often use the word spirit in a kind of strange philosophical way. But the Bible doesn't. It talks about the Holy Spirit. The unity of the Holy Spirit. Well, they're in and we're in. That's how they had to learn that. He's a slave, I'm a free man, but we're in this together. He's born on the wrong side of the tracks. He comes from a bad background. He's poor, I'm rich. No, no, all that's got to go. Because we're preserving 
another unity which should battle the world. Battle the world. In fact, Paul says this. He quotes from the Old Testament where God says this to his people because they're going after all the other gods, Baal and other stuff. And in the Old Testament, God says this to Israel. You have made me jealous by worshipping gods who are no gods. You're supposed to be my people. You've made me jealous by worshipping gods who are no gods. Then he says this, I will make you jealous by a people who are not a people. That's what God says. Back in the, And then Paul takes it up in the New Testament. God is going to make jealous the Jewish nation by a people who worship Yahweh and celebrate him and quote the Psalms and sing it. You people, you know him better than we do. And who are you anyway? You've got blacks and whites and yellows and colours. And What is this? You're not a people? No, we are. We're, we're the people. We're a body. We're integrated. We've got one spirit. God said, I'm going to do that. God's going to have a glorious church. A glorious church. Many membered, different background. Not that we've been cloned in our brain. The spirit has done it. The Holy Spirit gives us a unity. And Paul says, you've got to work hard, make every effort, the NIV translates it, to maintain that unity. We mustn't easily say, ah, I don't like him. I don't like him. No, 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 we've got to make every effort. Bart says this in his translation, I'm talking about this verse, he says, it is hardly possible to render exactly the urgency contained in the Greek verb. Not only haste and passion, but full effort of the whole man is meant. Not passivity or wait and see attitude. John Stott said it's calling for diligent activity to maintain unity. It's something we have to work at. It's not like, well, she knows my phone number if she wants to get in touch. He knows where I live if he wants to make it up. He started it. That's, no, no, that's not diligently working. Make every effort to maintain. Well, that's humbling. That's right. That's right. He may not receive me. That's right. But we make every effort because we want a glorious church. Amen? Amen. Beloved, it's about my personal attitude and taking Jesus seriously when he says, I want a church that is phenomenal, a phenomenon that makes people sit up and say, what is it? Who are these people? That's what the church is meant to look like. It's not about a building. It's about a people who are so together. So that's what it's saying here in Ephesians 4. We're in love, bearing with one another. That's the first one and the longest one, okay? The second one, we'll find later on in the chapter, where it says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up into all aspects, into him who is the head, even Christ. Okay, so speaking the truth in love. Now that could have two possible meanings in the context. It could be talking about the doctrine, because he contrasts it with false doctrines, deceitful words. No, you could need to speak the truth. Or it could be about truthfulness. We'll look at that later. Speaking the doctrines. That's the first context. It's we speak the doctrine. He says you don't want to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. When you've been a, a Christian, as long as I have, you find times of funny fads come through the body of Christ. Emphases, strange things. And sometimes people run after them. for what But that's not in the Bible. Yeah, but everybody's going after it. Yeah, but we don't really want to go there because we really want to honour the Bible. We've had to do that over the years when sometimes churches have got into this kind of a fad and you think, but actually it's not what the Bible says. And so that suddenly funny little doctrines come sweeping through and people get very excited about them. No, no, it's not what it says. We have to speak the truth. Like, uh, it's important. We don't say, well, I heard a friend of mine, a guy I like actually very much, he stood on a big platform, he says, Doctrine, he said, I hate doctrine, it divides. Let's go without doctrine. But, oh, don't say that, you silly man. <laughs> you, you need to know the truth. To set the, it says, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. 
We need to know doctrine. We, don't, we dare not say, oh, doctrine divides, let's not bother with doctrine, it just upsets people. No, no, no. You speak the truth in love. You don't hit people over the head and say, I don't accept that. I, I think this, I think that. See, the problem is we take the sword of the Spirit, a little bit like Simon Peter. You know, he took the sword and cut someone's ear off. We can be like that. Because of our aggression, we don't help people, we just cut their ability to hear us off. They get offended because, oh, I'm a this, I'm a that. I believe that, I believe that. And, and we, can, we can hold, the, we can be contentious with doctrine. And that's, no, no, speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth. We need to, we need to find the truth. We need to, actually the Bible says contend for the truth. But you don't have to be contentious. You have to hold ground. Hold the truth. It says in James 3, the wisdom from above is peaceable, gentle, open to reason, unwavering. That's interesting. <laughs> in one verse, you've got, well, it's open to reason and unwavering. In one verse. We would say, oh, he's unwavering, or oh, he's open to reason. Two different people. No, we'd, we'd be able, we're supposed, because we've become mature by the grace of God, we're no longer children being tossed around. We become mature, we can handle, yeah, I'm unwavering, I don't quickly change my position. I don't run after the latest paperback and change my theology. Or have you heard this? Wow, that sounds good. But no, no. We, don't, we, we, uh, we tend to be unwavering. We say, no, this is what I believe. It's what I feel is what the Bible says. But at the same time, it says in James 3, open to reason. In other words, hey, I, I, you know, thank you so much. I've never seen that. Well, boy, you know, it says it's there in the Word. Some of us had to do that with our, you know, what I was speaking last night about the Holy Spirit. Some of us hadn't been raised with that. Some of us hadn't experienced that. I mentioned last evening, and I won't have time to explain it all, but of a Baptist man who was in a meeting in, in South Africa, I was at a couple of months ago, and, and I, he said, boy, this is all new to me. New to me, and he's in his 60s, an experienced pastor. He says, this is all new to me, but he was open to reason. And he changed his position and got wonderfully blessed. But by character, he was not unwavering, and what's new to me. So we speak the truth. We, we, we don't just shout at one another. And sadly, of course, in our online generation of twittering and screaming at one another online, we don't even have to look anyone in the face, just blah, blah. We, we don't want to go there. But we don't say, well, don't speak doctrine, it just divides. That is silly. We need truth. Without truth, we'll not grow. If we need to speak the doctrine, you'll get it spoken from here week after week. We speak the truth to help us think right, to get lined up with what the Bible says, but we do it in love. Amen? Amen. We do it in love. We don't try and just spear people through because we, we can all grow we learn some more we learn some more we don't run after and it's interesting it says it contrasts children being tossed around with one mature man so it's not only that the children are vulnerable to false doctrine they're individual children running around but the contrast is one one new man a mature man we're so in this together God wants us to be speaking the truth in love. But then also, it could mean just be truthful. Because later in the chapter, chapter 4, verse 25, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We're members of the same body. So be truthful with one another. Now, that's something we have to be fairly disciplined about. Because I don't think many of us wake up in the morning and think, what lie can I tell today? <laughs> I don't think Christians do that. I don't, you know, I think we, but we are vulnerable to exaggeration, generalization, because to, to make our point. You know, she's always saying it. She said it once before. Everybody's talking about it. Your two or three close friends are talking about it. It's so easy to overstate, to make your point to generalize. 
And we can wander into that in order somehow to, to, and to make our point. But the Holy Spirit, if we're walking in truth, doesn't need that. We don't have to exaggerate. We don't have to. We, let, we don't need to pass on a message that we're not sure if it's true even. That's how gossip works. Have you heard? Really? Wow. I want to tell you something I've just heard. <laughs> Did we check up? Oh, I haven't got time for that. I've got some juicy stuff. It says in Proverbs that gossip's like juice that goes down. <laughs> have you tasted this one? And I've got the juice and you haven't. So it makes me kind of, I've got something. I'm, it gives me a bit of prestige. I've got the juice. No, and we say, no, I don't want to go there. That's how churches get messed up. Because people start sharing, but that isn't true. I didn't, I didn't actually say that. And that happens. We say, God, help us. We don't want to go there. Because we, why? Well, we want to build a wonderful body. And so we, we, we have to be careful about that. And Paul says, don't do it because we're members of the same body. See, imagine, imagine my eye being part of the same body as my foot and saying, I'm not going to tell foot that there's a step here. Well, you don't do that because it's the same body. It's crazy. It's like saying, I'm not going to tell foot there's a step there. No, it goes straight out, you see. So, so I says to foot, <laughs> it's straight. But the stupid thing is, because we want to say, I might go straight over and bash my eye as I fall. <laughs> so Paul says, no, you're members of the same body. You'll hurt yourself, ultimately. Don't do it, you're members. We're trying to build a family. We're trying to build more than a family. We're trying to build a body. Okay, so speaking the truth in love. And then the last one is just one verse later where it says in verse 16, the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for building up of itself in love. All right, so now building up one another itself in love. We're building one another up in love. That's the last one of these three. First one is bearing with one another, the second one is speaking the truth to one another. third one is building one another up. We come, it says in Ephesians 3, with all the saints to know the fullness of Christ's love. We do this together. The word together is so common at the beginning of the book of Acts. We build one another up together. You have to be together to do this. The book of Acts says they were together. You just keep on reading it. Act, they were together. They were at the Solomon's place. They were from house to house. They were together. They were together. They were together. You always get the feeling that the early church lived together and went out each day into the world. Whereas we tend to live in the world and occasionally come together. Their center of gravity was together. So if we're going to build, we need to be together. That means physically, you know, together, together. Build it so we can build one another up. That really means if we're going to be part of it, we need to be in what is available to us, like the small group system. So, well, I come on a Sunday when I can. The mm. best thing is to be together, to get into one another's homes. You have meals together as well. The marks of the early church, they ate together with glad and generous hearts. This word together keeps on coming up. They were together. We begin to share our hearts. We begin to, see, as I said, you cannot come to maturity alone, and we're not meant to. The world's so lonely. It's terribly lonely. And that's why we've tried to build a family of churches, because you even find pastors who are lonely. I went to Bible college. They told me this. This was official... Bible college teach. Do not make friends with people in your church. That's what I'm instructed at the, what was the best Bible college in Europe. Most famous one. That was the official line. Don't make friends with people in your church. If you want to find a friend, find a pastor in a nearby, t nearby town. What rubbish. It means the pastor is the loneliest guy in the church. Except for his wife who's even lonelier. And some of these congregations just move the pastors around. I was speaking to a guy in South Africa who headed up a denomination. He said, I move the pastors every three years. I said, what? Well, I move them around every three years. So I think they've given what they've got in three years. 
I said, you just made the man the loneliest guy in the church. He doesn't know anybody. How can he exhort them to come on, come together? He doesn't know a soul. He's only been there three years. He's going to be moved again. People have constructed churches so badly. We had a Methodist church in my hometown. He was a real evangelical, an evangelist. So people being saved. The Methodist church began to come alive. And then the, the system moved him and put in a liberal to balance him who emptied the church out. Stupidity. After that, we've got to get church right, beloved. The pastors who love the people, who are loved by the people, people knowing one another together, they were together. How can I encourage others? How can I build one another up if we're not together? So being together, every part, it says here, working properly. It's terrific, isn't it? See, when I was converted, I didn't know I had a part to play except to be there. Don't forget the gathering. Be there. So you can hear my preaching, which was terrific. But that's all I had to do, be there. But that, that's what the Bible talks about, a many-membered bo body with every part working properly. My first church, I used to go and visit a lady in hospital uh, in another town nearby, and she was a wonderful, one of these radiant, sweet, old believer lady. It's just a terrific lady. It was a privilege to go and speak to her. And I just sit and talk with her from time to time. And she'd had a kind of stroke. One side of her body wasn't functioning. And she used to laugh. She'd sit there and say, stupid arm doesn't work. And she'd throw it. <laughs> and she'd pick it up and put it up. <laughs> but she just laughed. She mocked. She said, that's a serious thing. <laughs> See, it wasn't working properly. So she couldn't do much. The body that couldn't do much because of the part doesn't work properly. God wants a church where every part is working properly. We're not just passive. It's not just, oh, it's a good church, it's got a good man. You, know, you hear that kind of, oh, it's a good church, it's got a good man. And what, what, what do you mean? Well, he does it all. And we go along and listen to him. Then you build a mega church on a very good man that does it well. And no one's doing anything except coming and listen to him. But to be in a church where it says apostles, prophets, I haven't got time to go into that in Ephesians 4, but apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for works of ministry. Who we all we have a part to play. All kinds of gifts. So grateful for a lady that used to have the, the wonderful gift of hospitality. So one of the lists, list of gifts. Hospi she used to be in our first church and at the end of the meeting she'd stand at the door and she'd say to me, are there any students in this week? And I said, I think they are. I said, send them down, send them down. And she said, you and Wendy come as well. So after, you know, Sunday morning, we, we go down to her home, it's like four students, and Wendy and me, and she said, how did she do this? There's the table, you know, somehow the table expands, I don't know how you do this. <laughs> and it was a gift of God, it wasn't, oh, this is flipping hard work. It was like, this is wonderful, welcome, nice to have you in, do come in. You think, how did she make the food go round? It's beautiful. She helped us build a church with her gift of hospitality. So it's not all public voices in the meeting. Praise God for voices in the meeting. And when we started the Bible Weeks in England, we're going to have, at first, we're going to have about 3,000 people. I mean, it grew to 30,000. But I, I thought, do a Bible Week. Okay, we'll do one. I thought, what do you do with 3,000 people on a field? And my friend Nigel Ring said, this sounds fun. I mean, when we finished Stonely Bible Week, you may have heard of it, you may not have done. By the time we finished, we were 30,000, just short of 30,000. And Nigel said to me at the end, he said, do you know, because we finished it, do you know, he said, there were a thousand job descriptions. A thousand people fulfilling roles. How do you do that? Oh, I'll just preach if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got that gift. The chaos. Thank God for that dear man that was by my side for years. Thank God for people. And that one day we felt we need to, we need to get into publications. We need to, and I met a guy got flair. Nigel was reliable, detailed, terrific. This guy, had, he thought outside the box. He got us doing things I would never have dreamed of doing. Thank God for the body of Christ. If everything had to come from my mind, we'd have been a very boring movement. 
We need one another. I thank God for people who they see different, the prophetic people who see around the next bend. I can't see around there. But they see. They see things. The gifts of the Spirit make us come to maturity. We need one another. Every part working properly. We need to equip people to work properly, help them through, learn how to move in their gifts. But the, the, it says in the Bible, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each of us for the common good. Each of us has a special gift. It says, employ it in serving one another. There's that one another verse again. That phrase, one another. As each has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the grace of God. Maybe God's given you a gift of hospitality. Maybe God's given you some of those. Maybe you're one of these people who thinks outside the box, we could do this and this and this. You know, the, that warehouse, boy, some people thinking outside the box, we could do this with it and that with it. Wow, I never thought of that. You know, a pastor may not think of that. This gifting is different. You could think, we could do this. Wow, that could reach hundreds of people. Thank God for you. You thought differently. Because we're a body with all kinds of contributions. And we walk in gentleness and lowliness. We bear with one another. We speak the truth. God help us that we say, no, if he said that, it's, it's going to be true. I don't have to test that. No one's, he or she would never pass their thing on without it being true. Not careless with our language. Oh, so and so says, well, you have to think, oh, I better check that up because I'm actually... He's not reliable. When he says some things, I'm never quite sure if it's true. That doesn't help build the body. So we've got, some of us have got to learn discipline because before we became Christians, we did that all the time. Now we've come in. Now I've got to, I need to change. Well, some of us, when we're in the, in the world, I'm Joe Blunt. What you see is what you get. I speak my mind. And people bring that into the church. Think it's godly. Well, I just speak my mind. You know, what you, you know where you are with me. Yeah, change, would you please? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, well, that's who I am. Please, straight. I'm straight. It says in the Bible, those who steal, steal no longer. Those who are full of themselves, be full of themselves no longer. If you say, well, I'm Joe Blunt, I'm straight. No, it's not very pleasant. We need to be changed by the grace of God. And we help one another, one another, one another. So we build a church that loves God and loves one another, gently, patiently, bearing with one another. Shall we do it? Yes. Shall we do it? And then when we first started, and we first started opening up to the gifts of the Spirit, which was all new to us, and a recent convert, a young guy, probably about 21, he stood up and absolutely harangued us in the name of prophecy. And he said, and then he sat down. And so I stood up and said, so do we all still love Steve? <laughs> you know, he thought he was giving us a word from God. It was really harsh stuff. But why? what do we do? Call him out now? Or we said, come on, this young guy, he's learning. Let's bear with one another. Let's build something. I want you to build something wonderful here. Release it. Grow, grow, grow. Build something that Joe can go out and boast about. Come and have a look. This is the sort of church I'm talking about. As he goes among the churches and sees others start. Come and have a look at it. This is what we've done. We just started with a handful. Now we're this. Look at the community. Look at the way we are. Come, come and have a look. That's what God wants. Some models. City set on a hill. Not that we're proud of it, but hey, God's in the midst. God, I love going to church. We think, wow, look what God's done here. Such a privilege. Such a privilege. Not just individuals but a body, a body. But the body is made up of many members. And one, you know, one suffers. A brother here cut his toe. His whole body knows about it. <laughs> We're in it together. You can't say, okay, toe, I'm lucky for you, toe. Put up with it. No, no, you know about it. We're in this together, amen? amen. Lord Jesus, I do pray you bless us. I pray, Father, let your hand be wonderfully upon this church. Bless it, Lord. I pray you bless the eldership. I pray for every small group leader. I pray for those even now working with our children, for musicians who serve and practice and prepare, people who set up the PA, 
working long hours. Thank you for many, Lord, who serve to make this happen. And Father, we just ask you, Lord, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, please keep breathing your life among us. Help us, Lord, to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Help us to love one another, to, to speak to one another. Help us to open our homes, open our hearts, open our lives up to one another, that we can grow out of loneliness into freedom. Thank you so much. I just thank you again for our sister's wonderful testimony this morning. If someone encouraged her, don't, don't back off, keep pressing through. Lord, she met with you so wonderfully. Lord, we just say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to encourage one another, bless one another. Build us up for your glory, Lord. Be glorified here in Fredericton and beyond. Let us see you have a church that thrills your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.